just the super high level of what this is about today is uh, what we learned during and after uh, our large projects that link together. Um, and we'll do some quick introductions of, well, would you wanna say a little bit about yourself and Katie, and then uh, we'll jump right into the project. Yeah, um, thanks for the introduction, Miguel. That was, that was actually pretty thorough. So I feel like, you know, we can do the official little slides there. But we also wanted to just make sure that we recognize Aaron Crooker too, who partnered with us, was very integral to the beginning of this project and eventually was able to let go of the reins and let us link our projects together for overall success. So just wanted to say hi to Aaron. And I will mention my voice is a little strained. Um, apologize for that. I'll clear my throat when I need to and I've got water on standby. So thanks for your patience with that. Um, a little bit about the project in general is it might seem like we're talking about you know big bad projects and breaking down big bad projects that might seem too big for in a particular unit, but a lot of this is scalable. And so some of the tips and things along the way, I uh, just think how that might apply to your office or to your unit. So the learning outcomes we're gonna talk about today of identifying the project, what kind of things stick out for that, how to break it down into chunks, and we'll talk about uh, some examples of where this fluidly linked together and create formal feedback loops for continuous improvement. And those feedback loops, what did that look like and how did we continue the improvement that we're working on? Sorry, these are our seats here. Hi, how are you? Do you mind me? Yeah, that one is pretty. Am I near the mother? We'll find some more chairs. I think we have to get behind there to get them, but sorry about that. So identifying the complex, our, our first, uh, tip here. So when we talk about the big projects, don't, they don't necessarily, they feel like they're universal, like I got to change the universe in order to get this done. Not necessarily. Um, maybe it's just that it's complex and it feels like it's really big. And so some of the things of it being complex um, is that it could be cross unit, division, department, all within maybe academic affairs per se. Or maybe it reaches across VC areas such as research and BFS, uh, that there's some project in between the two of those. Either way, they, they seem intertwined or maybe that you know they are, they just feel complex. Maybe it involves faculty and or staff and or students. And in the case of mine, it involved all three. I think all of ours included all three. It may just off the surface seem just too large and too time consuming. Um, other processes, meaning there's a golden rule everyone lives by, and I want to change this, but if I do, it's going to affect another process. What do I do about that? Change or create a policy. So again, maybe that thing that's out there is a policy. Maybe there is no policy, and that part of the challenge or what makes it seem complicated is that you need to create a policy, and where do we go from there? And previous failures, meaning this particular topic may have been attempted before, and now it's your turn to think about it, and you're like, well, it didn't work before, uh, this is gonna be complex. So those are the things that will help you identify what a complex project is that we came across. I'll turn it over to Katie for this part. Yeah, so way back in 2015, uh, kind of the landscape of the campus with regard to this class scheduling process was that there had been four other efforts in various departments to create a tool that would allow departments um, to work with their faculty to submit their proposed class schedule to the Office of the Registrar and do all the things uh, necessary to, to carry out that very essential work on campus. Um, but the efforts were fragmented, they were not adopted wide, widely, so there might be one or two or three departments using one tool and another department over here using another tool. There was nothing uniform. And so um, the Executive Vice Chancellor's Office um, uh, basically uh, took on this initiative and said, you know what, it'd be great if we could get one unified tool. Um, but at the time it was the Wild West. There was not a structure, um, there was not a, a well-defined plan. And so um, during that early exploration phase, um, things were very, very loosely understood and we had to start defining them. So this is the graphic that, that we developed a little bit later, but this is essentially for your understanding, a very high level overview of what the scheduling process involves. So there's this part in the beginning where there's committees or there's faculty groups in the departments that talk about what their course offerings are gonna be, or there might be, um, you know, in the case of the math department, there's a lot of GE requirements that the math department fulfills for other departments. So they kind of know what they're going to be offering, but 
every department has a different set of criteria. It's very different there in the beginning. The next step is that the department gathers the scheduling information and does a lot of stuff with it. Um, the registrar then receives the department information, um, at which point they're able to actually schedule out the classrooms. And the final step is publishing that schedule of classes final. Um, and so with this high level overview, it hadn't been sectioned into chunks. This is kind of the looking back in time. Hindsight is, you know, great. And we're using our hindsight to see what is it that we did that was successful that enabled us to link these projects together to have a bigger, um, a bigger success that was the sum of all the parts. Um, and I'll describe kind of what we did along the way. Okay, yeah, that'd be great. So yeah, the ISA, classroom scheduling, next one. Um, yeah, so in fall of 2015, it was decided there was gonna be this brand new application for all departments, divisions, and units to improve the ability to schedule classes. It was gonna be for staff, it was gonna be for faculty, it was gonna be for their office of the registrar, um, and for the summer session offices, offices, each of which has very distinct roles to play on different parts of the scheduling process. Um, and it was part of this effort from the EDC office to start doing process improvement across the campus in a, in a systematic way. And so we were kind of lucky to be on the, the, the beginning of that. Go ahead. Um, so what do you do when you're starting a new project? You start with what you have. At the point that I joined, there was a 30-person committee that had already had a series of meetings. Um, about seven to 10 of them were true subject matter experts who were very engaged. And I see some of them in the audience here, so it's nice to see some faces again. Um, and we really were starting with the current state, trying to think about what each of the departments and units was doing and where we were trying to go with it, um, and just starting to put a little bit of that structure down. <clears throat> um, so one of the first things that I did, at this point my role was as a user experience designer. So I came in and I said, we have all these different people, all these stakeholders, all these different processes, and we need to try to figure out one plan that we can all get on board and go toward. Um, so the first thing that I did was a current state process mapping exercise where I got, I think it was 10 folks in the room who were in various departments across campus and we just wrote down, we had them write down on index cards, all of the different pieces of work that they did to inform the class scheduling process and arranged it in this backbone along the top that was kind of a timeline um, and that had all this detail about touch points and how they were handing things off. I then translated that into a digital chart, um, which I shared out and used this kind of as the roadmap for where we were gonna go. This was kind of one of the foundational documents. Um, next slide, please. So in that initial current state mapping and in identifying who the personas were that we were gonna be talking about, you really start to understand who are your users and where do these handoffs occur? Who's handing what off to whom? Um, and what are the natural breaking points? Next slide again. Um, we were able to segment by the audience and the user type and start to ask the question, what, what in this process works for everyone and what only works for some? That's kind of that 80-20 rule that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Can we capture the 80% and deliver something that can work for most of the people on campus? Um, we also determined that obviously with the university, we're very driven by the student cycle, by the class cycle. and so. Um, when we were trying to figure out which piece of functionality to deliver first, it was kind of who can we hit that's that 80% and how can we do it in such a way that it will actually measurably improve their business process within the next cycle of time for class scheduling. Um, and we found out that some audiences had a totally separate timeline and so that kind of started to allow us to, to scope things, to chunk things, and to start getting a clearer picture of where we needed to go. Excellent. So using this process map, you can kind of see there were these, some really obvious points where there was like a pause and then something else happened and then a pause and something else happened. Um, and a lot of things that we just said, this is simply out of scope. And so this started us, um, yeah, just being able to, to more clearly define and see what the current landscape is. Um, next slide, please. Um, at this point that we were doing all of this analysis and then going back to this 30 person committee who had been involved for a while, um, we realized that there was a change in the expectations that we were gonna to deliver to them. Um, they were used to being told, we're gonna to do everything. It's gonna have every bell and whistle. It's gonna have this, that, and the other thing, and you know, butter your toast for you. Um, but we realized if we were gonna scope this in a way that made sense and that was actually in a deliverable time frame, we needed to actually be very careful about what we were saying and say it in such a manner that it was um, clear, concise, 
very direct. This is in scope and this is out of scope and this is the deadline. We cannot, you know, we have limited resources here at the university. We can't deliver all things perfectly in less than six months. Um, and we made those deadlines that we decided on very sensitive to their business needs. Like I said, according to the class scheduling timeline, according to what their uh, deadlines were either within their department or with regard to what they needed to provide to the registrar's office. Um, and we under promised, but over delivered. We knew that we could get this piece of functionality done and we knew it was possible that maybe we could deliver this other piece, but essentially we wanted to be, we wanted to build trust with them. This was a group that after those four other failed attempts and knowing that there were these other different ways that different departments do it, we really wanted to make sure that we were consistently on message and delivering what we said we were going to deliver so that we could build that trust back up and get our SMEs back on our board so that they could partner with us and continue with the work because we knew it was going to be longer than just a six month project. So at the end of the first set of deliveries, we realized this is great, but in order to continue getting work done in this targeted and deliverable way, we needed to narrow, not to having a 30 person committee, but to having a specific smaller set of people who are committed to, to um, helping us define the requirements and turn in documents. They had homework, they were engaged. Um, and it was really their job as champions to also go out and to talk to their colleagues and to be, um, you know, part of the change network in their own departments, able to spread the word, able to collect feedback, bring it back to us, and be this conduit of information flowing in and out. Um, so for the second phase of development, we had a work group instead of a committee. Um, I started establishing a regular communication timeline to leadership so that it wasn't just 30 people in a committee who go off and then their boss is like, what's this committee you're going to? You're always going to the committee, but I never see anything delivered. Now there was a mechanism to deliver that information back to the leadership and tell them, this is what we've been accomplishing. These are the incremental pieces of, of work that we've been doing. Um, and really keeping that meeting cadence consistent um, helps to, to, to keep the trust, hold the trust, sort of bring that trust to the leadership level so that they also trusted us and knew that if they had a question, it would be answered and that it was happening in a cadence that was um, regular and, and uh, consistent. Um, we also held some town halls and we did a lot of road shows traveling around and demoing to the departments, to the users, holding office hours, answering questions, um, all of these things so that we could really just take the work that we had done and leverage it to sit the field for, for future success. Um, and overall, just the main takeaway was always prioritize the work that will meet the next business deadline and make sure you hit that deadline. So at this point, Aaron had done the analysis. We had decided firmly that the ad hoc committee department work was out of scope. It was different in every department and it was different because it was necessary to be different, not because it was just chaotic processes, but because each department had very different needs. So that fell clearly outside of the scope of what could be accomplished for that 80%. Um, Aaron did her black belt on the sort of that initial phase where we were gathering all this information about how the departments schedule with their instructors, how they get that feedback, how many hundreds of hours are spent on email <laughs> collecting that information from the instructors. Um, and at that point, it was kind of good timing for my green belt to start because we were piloting a module that showed what 100% adoption would look like in delivering to the registrar's office. Um, yeah, so at that point, um, there was a simplified workflow that I had created for my Greenbelt project that showed, you can't read it, but this says registrar schedulers, this is the ISA, which is our system, and this is the unit schedulers. And so there were um, things that happened that were passed back and forth, um, and we were comparing what was happening in the ISA to what was happening with the unit schedulers. Next slide, please. Um, and actually go back one slide, sorry. It's hard not to be able to control your own play. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you can see the natural breakpoints here too. Obviously, like there's a big handoff here and there's a big handoff that comes back here. Um, mapping things out like that makes it really obvious, like what are the pieces that you can concentrate on and really know you'll have a big impact. Um, next, now the next slide. Um, so we had those natural breakpoints with well-defined metrics. We knew what was supposed to happen at those handoff points, and we knew who was supposed to provide what to who, and so we could measure that. It was a really good way of gauging um, the overall impact of the project. Um, and through that, we were able to split up the resources so that it made sense with those chunks. 
for versions one through three, it was all of the departments and all of the uh, campus schedulers and their instructors. The summer session module was the module that sort of mimicked the role of the registrar's office. And we knew that future state, we were going to be working with the registrar staff and, and going more into their process for the classroom scheduling. Um, if you look back at those things that I showed you before, it's very clear when you get into the details who the audience is, where that ends, and then it switches audience and what they're doing. And so just use that to, to define the scope and the resources a bit more. Next. Um, I'll say it again. We started with the business deadlines and worked backward. Um, this is a little bit more detail than I think you guys really need to know about, but essentially the takeaway here is that the September, November, January, and October deadlines each corresponded with a major business deadline for the office that was receiving the information. Um, and it was really important for us to understand those dependencies so that we could work with not only the people that we were building the functionality for, but the people on the other end who would be receiving it and make sure that that back and forth um, worked well together. Um, all along the way, we were using collaborative tools. We used Google, Team Drive, Lucidchart, uh, we were doing change management with the communication strategies um, and the, everything that we did was transparent and open so you could share all these documents with whoever you wanted across all levels um, especially as we got more into the leadership level um, those leadership reports were being linked out with direct links into our Google Drive they could look at the details if they wanted to it was all transparent and really set the stage for this just being a, a shared environment that we could bring anybody on board who needed to be part of the conversation to be um, yeah, to know what they needed to know at that point. And like teaser, it also set the stage for Kevin and my collaboration later on. Um, one thing that we did for the Change Champions was we celebrated every time we had a major milestone. Um, that included some lunches, some swag, some gift cards. Recognizing the effort that they were putting in and keeping up the momentum was really important because we needed to thank them for what we had accomplished, but we knew as before that there was still a lot more work to be done. And so keeping them engaged, making sure that we um, were listening to their feedback and uh, had a sort of a nice dovetail segue that happened when a new phase of work was identified allowed us to capitalize on what we had been doing and kind of move into the next phase. So when I was doing my green belt and having my Gemba walks and Kaizen's, um, Kevin and I started working together and started kind of sharing information and he actually attended my Gemba walks and my Kaizen so that he started getting steeped in the knowledge and the information that he needed to be able to start his project. We overlapped the work phases. It felt continuous to the SMEs. They were introduced to Kevin through me and they already knew me and had been working with me for a couple years. So introducing Kevin was a, a good segue. Um, and then we knew what the end point was so that we could say, this is where Katie's work ends and this is where Kevin's work begins with, you know, that handshake and that fluid continuity over the finish line. And so bringing us back to this simplified workflow, this was the world that I was working in, but when we got down to this level of detail, next slide please, boom, this is what was lurking inside just that box. And so seeing the complexity there and how much more there could be done. Um, this was a whole new piece of, of information that was like another black belt project just waiting to be tackled, um, allowing us to, to really expand the scope and, and keep doing the work. Because as you know, you know, you start pulling that thread and it starts unraveling the sweater and you're like, it's not just this one process that needs to be improved. There's a lot more that we can do all together. And especially since this project involved software development um, and a vended solution that Kevin will talk about a little bit more. Um, yeah, it just was really important to see the ecosystem of things that were happening and how changes to one affected the other or how improvements to one could pave the way for a bigger improvement on the next. So with that, we're here with Kevin. Aaron had that first box, I kind of had the second. Kevin had the third and I'll let him tell you all about it. <laughs> so my turn. Um, to be the, the new sibling into the family, if you will. Uh, it's all set up and I walk in. Can you click for me? Oh, yeah, or of course. There's some that are kind of rapid fire, so okay. I'll sure. point fast. Um, yeah, and so looking back to our uh, learning outcomes from the very beginning, we've been talking about fluidly linking projects and uh, project momentum. So as Katie said, in I, I walk into the family, 
is almost a repeat of what she just discussed here, but the business and the customers, both sides of the aisle, were already familiar with what's going on. And I don't work in the registrar's office. I think I, it may have been mentioned, but I work in the business office of the EVC doing special projects. So a lot of this, all of this was new to me, and I ask a lot of questions so I can learn and help. And that's a fresh perspective. So again, that complex or daunting project is still out there, but being new to it can be a benefit. And it's saved in shortened time, like she described, that we worked together on some of the meetings that we didn't have to ha have them separately just because we were two different projects. And working this all into a certification timeline was a bonus, so I got my black belt out of doing the work that we needed to do. Uh, just mention that, the scope. The scoping of this that Katie talked about was really important in, for everything to line up, which is what this shows. And I, I think, anyway, next. Um, so when we got to the savings, you could see here how each of us saved different amounts, but that's the size and the stipulations for a black belt to save at least 100,000, a green belt to save 40,000, um, and then it all adds up slide, to 615,000 so far, and we have more to go and side projects that aren't even on here. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So Katie's slide that she showed earlier with the red box became, oh, sorry. Oops, became this one. <laughs> and this became the scope for the overall process that I was working with. And what, what you're looking at here is after, with the ISA and the departments providing, I have these classroom requests to the registrar, so all the academic departments turning those in in all kinds of methods. Uh, Katie's project was about streamlining that communication process and getting it to here. Um, the next, actually go back please. Yep. They process all of that and then it takes us all the way to the schedule of classes and classes happen after that and it can go on and on. But again, based on the timeline of the course I was taking and you can only chew on so much at a time, I had to really define where, what that is. And this became my total scope. When you started looking at this part here, the handoff, okay, is when the information changes hands to the registrar schedulers, we started realizing some of those are Kitty's green belt and some of those were definitely the black belt and others were a little gray and we either barely touched or didn't touch it and decided at the beginning what's in scope and out of scope. It's like. So the other part of all this is, is the flow and the information flow. So this is one example within my project of how information flowed. We did a voice of the customer survey with all the academic departments, the schedulers in those departments. When we got the materials back, we had a Kaizen event with registrar schedulers combed through all the results. What does this mean for you? What are the takeaways? How do you feel about this? What's important? Did the same thing with the pilot group of department schedulers. Here's how your own peers answered all of these questions of what's going well, what do you want to do in the future, how do we fix it, those sort of things. So then consolidated results, consolidated results and all the results went to a small committee. And so this small committee has all kinds of information. We know how the business feels about this. We know how the customer feels. And here's the data that we have. And they had one task, to create the new process. And so they, they did it from there. But that's the example of the information being open and transparent and flowing through all the in, important people at the time. So moving from that task or that outcome into the next one of formal feedback loops for true continuous improvement. Um, a lot of times in any project, if a solution is provided, you may try it, how's this going, give me some feedback. But we really pushed in the voice of the customer survey to say, what's broken? What makes, you, we didn't use these words, but like, what makes you angry? What's frustrating? What takes a lot of your time? Like really ask what are the problems that we can fix? It's like, so when we talk about continuous improvement, I just want to make two little points real quick. You've, you've heard the words over and over, I'm sure, if you're on, on this campus. Um, but the incremental part of improvement, it doesn't say continuous improved. It's not over. It really should say continuous improving because it's ongoing. 
but it's an improvement, one little improvement and another and another and another. So there, there can be little wins to celebrate along the way. And to have really good continuous improvement if you're thinking about it as a group and listening to your group and they're allowed to suggest, then you can continue that actual improvement. Slide. So the, the voice of customer feedback. What I want to share about this kind of comes out in the next slide too. But we asked the regist sorry, the schedulers in the academic departments, 58-ish departments. What's been going on in the past? How do you feel about things now? Where do we want to go in the future? And we divided those questions uh, into sections of the quarterly process. Each quarter, the scheduling process happens, and then again and again. So it's going round and round. The scheduling refers to the actual scheduling. I have Chem 101, and I want it to be in this room. Well, that can, how does that process work? So it's about the scheduling. And then Katie's project, the ISA, relatively new, but still existing, and we ask a lot of detailed questions about that. So uh, slide, 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 three of them. So in looking at the quarterly process, how do we make that better in the future? We ask the million dollar question. All, all bets on, off, I don't know. If you could do anything you want to, what would you do? In the scheduling side, we're introducing series 25. Now just for context, uh, 20, series 25. 25 yeah, 25 Live is the overall, sorry, 25 Live is the actual scheduling. Series 25 is a series package of things, but 25 Live, you'll see that term. That's the specific computer scheduling. Instead of them doing it on paper, they can do part of it automatic and enter the rest and it saves a lot of time. That was the bulk of implementing uh, for my project. How do we make that clear and transparent in the decision making and the status? Like what, what's going on? Where are things right now? How do we handle all that? And then with ISA, how can we make it easier to use, standardize, and get automation benefits out of that? So we got a lot of information just from one customer feedback site. So in this project, kind of looking forward now, right? So you saw the, the blue lines with the arrows and there's future projects, and I talked about spin-off projects. So both of us have talked about scope. And one of the things with a big, bad, complex project is you don't want scope creep and you go on and on forever. It's very well defined. Now, once you define that and you're working along, it's like, well, what about this? Like maybe one of those gray boxes we saw earlier. What do you do with that? It could be a whole nother project uh, for Lean Six Sigma. It could be a certification project, depending on the savings and how big it is. It might just be a project manager project that you know what needs to be done. It's just a little larger and needs somebody to manage it. Or it could be the sponsor that just says, I have something to do. I'm going to tell everybody and check that off. It's done. So there's all these levels of these spin-offs that you're keeping track of along the way. Well, why is that important today? We're talking about linking projects to tackle a big, bad project. And this is one way of just parking lot. Set it aside. It could be somebody's project um, or certification. Examples in mind of how those spun out. There is possibility to use 25 Live even more than what we implemented. We can expand the self-service on the customer side or the academic department, and they can do a little bit more than what they're set up to do in the beginning. We could do a single source for alternate assignment requests leadership messaging, transparent annual process. This one is kind of big. Pre-assign are for classes that have to happen for a lot of people. So they take precedence, but nothing's written about those. So set this aside, it's not my project today, but uh, click please. So when I look at all these things that came up as possibilities in the future, they're in different categories. This is where we get this huge matrix of helping you identify these to somebody else. So the first one was really a scope issue. It was out of scope and it could have its own scope. It might be large for a project manager or a Lean Six Sigma project. And think about these in the terms of your own unit or department. You know what's going on in your head of, I really wish we could work on this or fix that. If you divide it down, maybe it's something the sponsor can do as a simple task 
or that a project manager can handle because you need to change a service. By further clarifying it, it makes it not as complex and better understood. So it could be scope, service, a simple task, a change in culture, or actual policy, additional, or change. So what we, uh, you can do all three on this. Um, what we learned during, um, that Katie's already talked about, and especially when we looked back, at how important trust, respect, and empowerment was to get this big bad project through the same people working with us over and over. The trust between us and them was paramount so that they know what's going on. The respect of being prepared for each time you meet with them. Everybody, we are all busy. We don't have time to be wasting because you didn't do your homework. And mindful of their time and professional, let's get to it and get it done. And the empowerment, what I really like about the empowerment in my particular project is while we were bringing on this software and putting it up line, we had to go through configuration. And the registrar scheduling office of four people and two supervisors, they all went through the configuration. They all knew why this button did this item and how and when. So they fully understood that and they went through training of how to use it once they set it up. So they were very involved. They are encouraged to ask questions. They're encouraged, <laughs> they got a lot of encouragement. Um, and we also share with them the 15% rule. What can you do at your desk without further permission to make at least a 15% improvement to something that takes away from this big, complex, big, bad project, right? There's some things you can do on your own. And that's under the empowerment slide. So can do that. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah, so our learning outcomes overall, we hope this helps you understand a little bit more about being able to identify a complex projects, a complex project, to break it down into those discrete chunks um, based on different criteria or how things fall out. Um, fluidly link projects to ensure project momentum and create those formal feedback loops. So you really do have true continuous improvement across the board. Um, yeah, so we're happy to answer any questions. Um, the work is ongoing, so there's, there's future state that we might come back next year and do a new, whole new project on. But, uh, but yeah, this cool slide, um, slide theme is from Slides Carnival, which I learned about at Campus Lisa this year. And so if you need slide theme backgrounds, it's a good one. And just wanted to recognize that we, um, along with Aaron at the Czech Conference, the California Higher Education Collaborative Conference, just two weeks ago went up and received the award. Um, and it was a great night. So yeah, thank you all. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a great question. It, I missed the very last part. If they weren't able to have that, yeah. what what yeah. advice? Yeah, I mean, Zoom is a wonderful tool. I actually have a lot more meetings these days with ITS folks who are at North Torrey Pines, and my office is over in Ravel. It's like a half hour walk. So we've been Zooming a lot. Um, I think even just letting people know, like even an email introduction is better than nothing, right? Just saying like, this is my colleague who is from this office, set up the context for why you are feeling confident in letting that person work with you or, or feeling confident in introducing them to your team of people that you've been working at. Um, that would be one suggestion that I would have. And I have two. One is uh, coaching and the other is the documentation. Uh, we talk about Google Drives, Team Drives, um, putting it in a Team Drive where people can look at it when they need to and figure out their own questions and then follow up uh, was huge. And sharing things that have already been done, mm -hmm. you know, repeat it. I think I missed it on one of my slides. It's like uh, uh, improving the process improvement. By doing that, you know, we save time while we're trying to save time. Um, which was really important. And in the coaching part, as I mentioned, I, I knew nothing about this world. And she's like, ISA and IP, API, and I'm like, what is that? So what I would suggest at different locations is those conversations to even get on the same page, even before the, the details and data. Yeah, yeah, that was great. And I saw a hand over here. Oh, I, I... 
we're picking in each of these types of tools to share your information across your entire group. Was there ever the, the thought that maybe somebody's going to change something that you worked on without like, knowing why you did it a certain way? Was that ever a problem? Okay. <laughs> the thought does occur to me. Um, I think that people are less inclined to go in and change things if it's um, something that already a lot of thought and effort went into. So I do have a lot of documentation based on meetings where I'll have like 10 or more people in the room and then we'll talk through and have a brainstorming session and weigh decisions and then have to come back and make a final decision. I'm documenting that in the notes in such a way that there, it's very clear that like, this is the notes, this is the discussion there is a decision point that has to be reached and it's on this date. So unless they're correcting, like making a factual correction to the notes that we took, it really is a log of what comes next. And so if you discuss all these things at this meeting, I'm like gesturing, like as if you could see my spreadsheet. If you saw what was at this meeting and then saw what was at the next meeting, the next, the line for the next meeting is referring back to what was discussed at the prior meeting. And so um, I like to keep track of things in that sort of, it's almost like a, a, like a log sense and a lot of the Google tools do have a revision log so you can go back and see like who touched it when and what they changed. And so I think that having those logging tools available makes it a lot easier to, to make people, it actually, instead of being afraid that they're gonna go in and touch something, I actually like want them to feel empowered to be part of the creation of the documentation. Because if it's just me in my head and I'm just the one who's like got all these notes, like what's the good of that if I, you know, walk away tomorrow, then somebody else needs to be able to go in and read the notes and pick up where I left off. So and I yeah. smiled big because as I was getting started, she was preparing her final project mm -hmm. and she shared that with me. I'm like, not touching it. Like, I don't <laughs> want to mess that up. So I pull a copy offline, play around, whatever, delete. And it's, you know, it's just that allowed my personal safety and anything I put up, if it's that important, I might save a copy aside until we get through that aspect and put it back yeah. or you know or if you need a snapshot of a point in safety. time export a screenshot or a pdf Snapshots. of it and have that be yeah. the snapshot at that point in time yeah my question sure so i feel like like the physical focus now you let you go first. Like yeah. the software kind of tool, I would say Lucidchart. Yeah. It took a little half a day to futz around with it. But once I got going, I use it for everything now. It's just drop and copy and link and draw. Um, it's really nice. And I just learned about some other projects on campus that Lucidchart is, is becoming a big part of. Um, and it's free. And we, we all have access to it. So that's my favorite. Yeah. And I would say I also love Lucidchart, but for me, um, I do a lot of really messy hands-on work with, on the app development side, just trying to figure out what we're trying to do and prototyping things. And so for me, like whiteboard is always the first thing that I do because on whiteboard, you can get all the messy thoughts out there and then clarify and come away or using the index cards. And then you can like throw a bunch of index cards on a table and literally physically gather them and group them. Um, there are virtual tools that you can use to do that as well. That's called card sorting. Um, and card sorting is kind of like, it's like my oldest trustiest hammer in my toolbox. You know, like that's one of the first tools I learned and I go back to it again and again because it just works so well to just throw a bunch of information down and then just start seeing what naturally comes out with the organization of it. Um, but then I always translate that into Lucidchart nowadays um, so that it can be shared and then you can tweak what you've done. Once you've kind of reached the point where it's like mostly finished, then you can use that to keep it up to date on an ongoing basis. And take pictures of your whiteboard when you're done. Yes, take pictures <laughs> of your whiteboard, yes. One cool tool I'm working on the new uh, visual learning aggregate, so working with the Orkhan system, mm -hmm. you can lock it down in this chart. Mm -hmm. You can go, you can have, add your text box and stuff, whatever, and lock it down. People can have access and they can share it. Yeah. But they Make changes to it. So, view only. Because mm -hmm. within Lucidchart, if you move stuff around, the whole thing shifts. Yeah. The lines get wonky. Yeah. yeah. And same with Google Drive yeah. stuff, too, right? You can make it view only if you need to. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my question is more about the cost initiation and the buy in. Like, this is a cross departmental effort. Mm -hmm. Some of the hardest parts of these types of projects is the buy in, is the yes, this is a priority for my department. So how, can you talk a little bit more about how that all played out and 
how did you make this a priority for all the departments involved? How did you like bubble that up, given that everyone has different kind of strategic vision mm -hmm. for the way that their department's going? So how did you kind of wrangle all that? That's a good question, and I think it's an ongoing effort because it's not like we waved a magic wand and everybody was like 100% on board, we're ready to use it. We have definitely heard feedback that for some departments, it's like a miracle godsend, they love using it, and for other departments, they're like, it still doesn't do half of what I need it to do. So the ISA itself is is being um, continuously improved. It is being it is in active development. We just started a new phase. We're taking feedback. We're adding new features. And that's going to be a years long process. So that's, that's my day job as well as it just being like a piece of the, what I did for the green belt. Um, what I, came to mind for me when you asked that question is it kind of bubbled up before I walked in again, the last sibling to the story, but in bubbling up, it bubbled up because they had failed attempts previously mm -hmm. and not working, not working we have to find something that works. Mm -hmm. And so the IT side of the house and the registrar side were both ready and then it became. So working at it from the other direction, um, I don't know, providing, the first thing that comes to mind is providing the benefit and just give them the short nitty gritty, how this is gonna work, estimates of time, like a usual project, but. Yeah. yeah. And I and I think since the departments were on board first and they were ready they were like we would like a tool, we need a tool. This is a very onerous process on us. It's very time consuming. Having the departments on board for the first phase of the project, um for Aaron's black belt, for my green belt, having the summer session office come on board for that module of it, having that be a proof of concept for how the registrar's office piece might might work. It really was like an incremental addition that we kind of like had a group of stakeholders who got on board, who we worked with, who we developed that relationship with, and then we added another piece of it and then developed that relationship. And, you know, and just keep on going, finding out really what are the things that they need to enable their business to happen? What are their pain points? How can we solve that for them? And paying attention to that so that we can, you know, we're not just like waltzing in, like we're gonna solve it all with the magic wand and then leaving them in the dust. Like we're actually continuously working with them on it, so. Um, I saw a couple hands over here. Yes. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. the of the yes, yes, they do. Uh, the instructors, you mean? Like, yeah. yes, I actually did a series of user um, usability studies with instructors, sat down with them. I think three or four were laddering faculty, a few unit 18 lectures, and we walked through and did usability tests with them on the instructional scheduling preferences side of it. We also did demos to faculty groups. I think we demoed to, I know we did VizArts, I think we did engineering, we were invited to their faculty meetings and demoed and were asked questions and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the continuous feedback loop. How did you accomplish that? Was that just through survey, uh, voice and customer surveys, mm -hmm. hammering people for referrals? Like, how did you do that? Both of those things. Um, <laughs> there is a, a feedback button that's available all the time in the app, so we get probably two or three request yeah for the ISA I get my team gets two or three requests probably every week week and a half two weeks and then sometimes when something breaks we'll get a flood of requests um, but we also that's not only bug reporting it's also like hey it would be great if this could be better and so we collect all of those and then put it in our JIRA backlog and then prioritize them when it comes time to um, map out what we're doing for the next year so we just did that exercise we're doing like a highly requested piece of functionality that's gonna be launching in February right now and a different twist on that from my portion with the registrar schedulers and the department schedulers was back and forth communication, meeting with them as a group with targeted questions and taking that feedback, sharing it with the other group. Instead of doing it all in the same room, then it becomes like all of this. But encapsulate what are your key points, encapsulate your key points, let's share and discuss. And then along the way through those uh, Kaizen events um, that happened in each. Yeah, and when he did his voice of customer survey, he shared it back to me because there were comments on the work that had already been done. Yes, and we used that in our prioritization discussions yep. this year. Yeah. Yes. For mine. Yeah. 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 Because and the registrar is the customer. So they're looking at like, what are we doing wrong? What are we doing great? And then the they're the business, sorry, and the customer, the department who's submitting to the business, uh, what did they say as a group? 
and then it got shared together, but that was that focus group where I had a representative from each and the registrar and IT. Katie, <laughs> Katie IT, uh, got in a room together to use all of that information together. And that's a more manageable scenario than the six and the 12 that yeah. we had in the other groups. And for my group, I have a representative from the registrar's office who sits with the work group, the department, uh, members on our weekly meeting and so it's actually a really cool thing because with her sitting in the room and the scheduler sitting in the room and then being able to ask each other questions when an issue comes up when they say like oh this doesn't work right or we don't know how to do it she's able to just be right there and like give them an answer or vice versa um, and so that has really helped cut down on the number of meetings we've had to have or the number of things that I have to like take a note and go run and then ask and then come back um, and since we're sort of co-creating this this app together um, with an eye toward what it could do in the future, like potentially in the future, having her as part of the, um, the ideation, the brainstorming that we're doing allows her to give input into like, well, if you do it that way, it's going to affect our office this way. So don't do it that way. And then we'll tweak and adjust and be able to have that back and forth dialogue, which has been really, really great so far. Yeah. And kind of on that note of the back and forth dialogue and the ripple effect of changes, this project has spawned like a governance committee that will continue so that if this changes, these people know about it. If we're going to tackle this, what else does it affect? Mm -hmm. And so that's uh, starting now. So we can keep the conversation going without losing those pieces. Yeah. 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 What? Well, what are your biggest lessons learned? Biggest lessons learned. I know mine. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> the big bad complex project. Uh, the question was what are the biggest uh, takeaways or lessons learned. For me that big bad project and complex, once we started getting, and I didn't know anything about it, remember? Once I got into it and realized the support was there, important, the scope was there, just step by step. A little sticky, it's, it's like uh, breathe, have patience, um, and uh, small increments. Like this day, even if I send one email on that project, I'm making motion forward. So it was a huge takeaway for me to tackle the Black Belt project uh, to make something work out. So slow down, make yeah. it work. And I swear we did not rehearse this because I think my takeaways are exactly <laughs> the same. Basically, like tightly drawing the scope and then being very consistent in how you're achieving that has been the most important thing that I can do. Um, especially the scope that helps actually in two ways, not just for the stakeholders and the, for them to have a very clear expectation of what you'll be delivering. But when like I'm the project manager for the project now, and so I'm meeting with the stakeholders and then I'm also having internal meetings with my development team. And so if I'm in a stakeholder meeting and the scope creep starts to happen, and they're like, what about this? What about this? What about this? I know that if I look over at my devs, their faces are going to be like, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, okay, 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 okay. Scope, scope is important because not only is it helping establish a clear expectation with an actionable and achievable outcome, but you're also not overburdening the people who are doing the work on the other side or creating, a, yeah, just something that's sort of an inflated but unachievable goal for on both a practical level and on a um, sort of political level. So yeah, so scope, 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 and consistent delivery. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming so much. Thank you. Gail has a message. Uh, yeah. Gail, you had something. Sure. Uh, eventually. Uh, the the part about the we're taking it to to nationals. Yeah. So to speak, the show on the road. We're going to be in Michigan for the uh, international conference for lean and higher education, and uh, giving this presentation there, and then. Maybe after that we can do the slides. Yeah. yeah. And then I have two giveaways. Uh,